very much indeed. Good evening. Thank you very much indeed. Good to know you're there. Anybody else there at the moment, or are you still recovering from the day? Um, you genuinely, please feel totally at ease in terms of coming and going and getting to more tea and buns and so on. And um, also, you'll be spending quite a bit of time in the course of this, this session talking to each other. So just make sure you're sitting next to your intellectual equal, please. Is there something? <laughs> you are comfortable about that, too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> <I'm not. laughs> right. There are, I mean, this really is, for many people, I think one of the great professional challenges in the sense that it's very rare that um, professionals in any walk of life just have to cover the amount of ground involved in the, the research aspect of your master's program. You know, it's not nor you don't usually write 10 to 12,000 words, do you? you know, it's, that's not part of your normal daily routine you know, of producing that amount of wordage. And it's quite a, a challenge, and it's also something which has you know, got real professional significance. And so what I want to try and do is just go through a series of steps. And if you had a look at the handout, you see how I'm going to approach it. And to really give you an opportunity to share ideas and share um, it, um, experiences and issues. You, you just stop me and question at any time. But hopefully, as we go through the session, picking up on these are issues that I need to address. These are things that I need to find out more about. But, uh, yeah, but well before we finish, please, don't leave here with unasked questions. Make sure that if you want to raise issues, that you do so before um, 10 to 7. So let's take some fairly pragmatic starting points. And I suppose the first one is that, well, this afternoon I had a real privilege of working with a colleague who's just at the very end of her PhD process. And at the moment, her thesis is 99,500 words. And it's just awe-inspiring how people actually get to that stage. And the notion is she is passionate about the subject. Yeah, It's her life's work, basically. And so if you think about writing 99,000 words, which is longer than most novels, then you've really got to be focused and believe this is something important and interesting, don't you? So the first issue I'd put to you, because under pressure from work, under pressure from home, under the fact that you've got to do this you know, in all sorts of different times and spaces and so on, you need a topic that is of, of significance to you. You need a topic that's got legs. You need a topic that you can perceive some value in completing. And I can't stress that strongly enough because otherwise it can become a chore. And that's a real tragedy. I think that's you know, really sad if you're just plowing through the words to get there and you're not saying this is useful, this is significant, or even this is enjoyable. So a major consideration for you is the extent to which you have got a personal commitment to the topic that you're going to engage with. And I would say you really need to look hard at it. Because quite often people will start out on a topic and then find that it's not appropriate or it simply <coughs> can't sustain itself through the whole, you know, the full range of doing a piece of significant research. You need to be politically circumspect because you are investigating what's going on in your own school sometimes. And my favorite horror story on that is the gentleman who was doing a master's degree with the Open University, and um, he wanted to do something on marketing the schools in the days when that was very much one of the key themes. And he, he designed a questionnaire to, for parents, running to be one, uh, and sent it out, and got replies back and wrote it up. And then, purely by chance, his head teacher discovered what he'd done and called him in and said, I do think it would have been a courtesy if you'd asked me about this first. And then it went on for half an hour as to how, how courtesy might be expressed. And he left a very chastened and a very um, a much deeply moved young man because the head said, you cannot use any of this data. Yeah, and so you, you need to be personally confident about it. You need to know that you've got enough capacity to see it through. And crucially, you need to be aware that sometimes this is sensitive. Yeah, 
And I once made the mistake of doing what was essentially um, a, 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 a measure of school climate and approached one of my colleagues and he simply refused to do it because he said, I, I'm not a very happy person at the moment. You know, I don't want to know about this. And therefore, you need to know, you know the reality of the context in which you're working. So be very, very circumspect in saying, is this really going to work for me? It, can I really get the mileage out of it? And pivotally, is it possible? Is it doable? Simple as that. Because you may have very, very real aspirations, but actually, is it going to make a difference? Is it going to work for you? So that's the first issue I'd put to you. The second issue is question one, which is what are you actually looking to do? And it may be that you are saying, I'm going to contribute to, to the sum of human knowledge. And that's wonderful. But that's not maybe the most useful use of this kind of activity. You may be that you find that if you don't get it right, you'll simply be contributing to the sum of human misery. So you do need to be consciously aware that the purpose of doing this research is to, and then I think usually it's something to do with school improvement, isn't it? It is about looking at, in the final analysis, a change in practice. It is about moving your your team, your colleagues, your department, your understanding in school forward on a certain topic. And that really is the most powerful form of research in education, I think. That research which is absolutely focused on how do we make this better, how do we make this work, crucially, how do we really build confidence that my time, my energy is going to make an impact. And what I would suggest to you is that an acid test all the way through is what will happen as a result of me doing this research. And therefore, it's got to be personally engaging, it's got to be professionally appropriate, it's got to be morally appropriate. Okay? Lots of nodding going on around there. Is that all fairly coherent for everybody? So, you've already started thinking, you've already already started the process. With your neighbour, please, two things. Firstly, hello, how are you, if you haven't already said so. And then secondly, what looks to be, at the, the moment, the key topic that is going to dominate your thinking this evening and in terms of your decision. Have you identified it? What does it look like? Where are you going? What, at the moment, is your understanding of the area that you want to work in? Just a two or three minute introductory buzz, please. Yeah. Any thoughts at this stage, or are, is it too early in the session for conversation? Okay, I'll move us on. Now, part of the process of really producing a compelling piece of work that actually does make a difference is to be, as I just hinted earlier, very, very sensitive to context. And therefore... You need to be very rigorous, I think, in terms of really defining the context, because in many respects, um, all research is context-specific, isn't it? You, you, you cannot have context-free research, essentially. And one of the ways I think of thinking about context is to think in terms of the three S's, self, school, and system. And so... The context, as far as the system's concerned at the moment, is probably one of the periods of greatest upheaval in education in two generations in this country. We're going through more change, and um, just listen to Mr. Gove on Thursday morning at 10.30. Um, you know, it, he's going to announce even more changes. And basically, we have a fundamental shift in the way in which our education system works. And it's very difficult to exaggerate it or in, be engage in hyperbole about just how much has changed. So your research is being done at one of the most dynamic and turbulent periods in school life, in, in, in living memory, basically. So that must have a very, very real issue, must not it? So the system is about the policies that are impacting upon your school. And it would be naive and very limiting to have a piece of research which ignored the fact that the Ofsted framework has changed out of all recognition, 
that the policies from central government are focused almost entirely upon raising achievement, however defined, and that the legal status of schools is changing at a hitherto unprecedented rate. All of that points to a very, very different working environment, which may explain why many of you are so tired. Yeah? Even though you've just had half term, you're tired, aren't you? Never mind, only eight weeks to go, is it? <laughs> yeah. Nine. <laughs> so, your research needs to be contextualised in terms of recognising that the demands upon the, um, the profession in terms of centrally uh, generated policies are very, very fundamental. The school issues, again, are a pivotal area in terms of your, your research being a success, recognising just where your school is and also the politics of the school in terms of issues which are or are not appropriate for you to raise and so on. I suppose that for virtually every school in the country at the moment, the, the driving force is this imperative in terms of closing the gap, isn't it? You know, that's the one that makes the difference. To what extent is your school demonstrating progress? To what extent are you moving towards a situation where the majority of lessons, i.e. more than 80% of lessons, are good or good with outstanding features or outstanding. Because that's the, that's the bottom line at the moment, isn't it? And um, I was working in a school yesterday that um, in a fairly challenging Midlands town, challenging part of Midlands town, sorry, and they've just got good secondary academy. And the reason they didn't get outstanding, even though they made remarkable progress, was simply because there were not enough outstanding lessons. So if we're being pragmatic, then we say, look, if I've got any energy, and if I'm focusing in on where the, my workplace, then the focus on the quality of teaching and learning has to be one of the driving forces, doesn't it? And I would guess that most schools now are addressing those two in a way that's never been the case before. Certainly the new Ofsted framework provides you with a very different culture of working, doesn't it? So it's that kind of issue that you say, if we look at the big picture, and then we look at the school picture, what are the really significant issues that are going to influence what, whatever topic I choose are to do, but, but th they will have an impact on it. And then thirdly, don't forget yourself in all of this. You know, because one of the issues, and I think that, again, um, it, 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 I, I regard it as fundamental to any piece of research, is that you are not an anonymous writer. You know, you are an actively engaged professional. And therefore, where are you in all of this? What's your perspective? Crucially, where are you coming from? What's your role in school? What do you see as the key responsibilities in school? And so on. And of course, this will change your own um, position, your school's position, and the policy position will all change. And so the the news from what a fortnight ago now that um, all of the proposals for changing Ofsted are going to be implemented apart from the no notice inspections. And so you can't be satisfactory anymore. You're requiring improvement and you can't be requiring improvement twice. And so if you're working in a school that I'm working with at the moment in, um, in Southampton, they had inspection in March, they were satisfactory. Well, that means they've got to be good next time, doesn't it? No option. Or they're going to be taken over. That's the context issue, isn't it? Let's be real. Let's be pragmatic and say there are real live issues here that need to be addressed and that at the heart of them is teaching and learning. Now, that's being, as I say, very pragmatic. But nevertheless, if you're going to do any kind of research which has an impact upon the quality of the way in which your school functions, then I think all of those have to be taken into account. Is that fair? Is that reasonable? John, may I ask you Please, please do, yeah. Uh, just, just for my sake, as much as for students, linked with the context of the school. Yeah. So among the students here, you might have independent schools, primary yeah. schools, comprehensive, whatever. <coughs> and some people are in traditional schools with it, it might mm. be autocratic, the full spectrum. And all I'm really asking you is, um, how cautious 
<laughs> or how much nuanced language yeah. should a student use because they kind of just say the head's rubbish and this or that. No, that is probably not a good idea. <laughs> so there they are, the MA students, right in academic papers. Yep. And in the contextualise of the school, you have to be very precise with language. Cause yes. Or field if they're attacking senior leadership to you. Yep. Or the head of faculty. Or it's a really interesting point, isn't it? Because you can't anonymise uh, uh, you know, yourself out of existence, basically. I mean, there are procedures whereby you can anonymise, but what you can't do is deny the fact that you're writing about your school. Yeah, and what you can't do is put in a dissertation which has no name on it, basically. And therefore, you're very subtle. You've got to be very cautious in saying there may be no go areas here. You know, that if the school is extremely dysfunctional because of the personal habits of the head teacher, then I really don't think you can actually put those in print. Well, it depends what they are, of course, but if they're unpleasant personal habits, then we really don't want to know. And you can't actually, you know, the, li the laws of slander are, are really quite significant. So that gives you an immediate caution, doesn't it, that if it comes down to the quality of human relationships in school, then I really am not going to be able to go there unless I am, you know, got incredibly robust evidence and I'm prepared to accept the consequences of going public. And that's a bit like the guy I mentioned earlier who did the marketing stuff. He ignored the internal structures and, and relationships and so on. So you've got to be politically savvy and you've got to work in an area where you can be confidently publicly robust. Would you agree? Yeah. 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 You know, it's no good having a wonderful topic which is about the total dysfunctionality of the senior leadership team. You know, can I research this, please? Oh, yes, please do come in and sit on our meetings. You know, I mean, we know you're fighting all the time, and we know that your meetings are a shambles and close to anarchy. And I'd like to write that up, please. Well, why not? It's nonsense, isn't it? So therefore you've got to be very clear that you are working within an area where basically A, you have access, and that's really important, and B, it can be public. Because technically the university publishes your dissertations. I know it doesn't come out in book format, but actually they become public documents. And therefore, you, it's a, thank you, it's a very helpful point you raised. You've got to be very clear in mapping out your uh, um, project that this is something that I can go public on and this is something where I won't find the doors being closed in my face because of the sensitivity of the issues involved. Yeah. Why is it that the underwater basket weaving department in this school is so, so bad? Well, the head of underwater basket weaving may have a problem with you doing that. Yeah? And there's the challenge. Any other examples around that? Obvious point, but in terms of context, quoting the Ofsted report, would that be then um, taking away your anonymity? Yes. Right. Yeah. But I mean, that is the, the Ofsted report, and again, don't take this as being literally true. The Ofsted report is objective data mm. uh, of a type. <laughs> and therefore, it's, public, it's in the public domain, and you can use it. And in fact, if you are looking at issues around certain factors, then the Ofsted report may be a very, very powerful piece of evidence in terms of explaining the school's current context. But again, you've got to be cautious because, for example, in the, um, the school I was referring to earlier, they have a sentence in the report which says, says something like, this school is good but not yet outstanding because not enough lessons are of outstanding quality. Well, that's quite challenging. But, and so you've got to think about the internal politics of the school. You know, how do you actually engage with colleagues around the fact that a significant proportion of the lessons are not of that standard? And people are very sensitive about that. But that's the sort of issue that may, may be necessary to engage with if you're really going to make an impact in terms of improvement and change. And sometimes we avoid the hard, um, the hard topics, but they're the important topics often. So thank you again for that. It's very helpful. Okay, so let's then move into the detail. And this really is almost sort of playing with, um, a bit like playing with uh, fridge magnets, you know, how do I arrange all these ideas? And uh, let me give you an example of the sorts of topics, areas that you might need to engage with. 
So, for example, closing the gap is a very significant component, I think, of any focus on teaching and learning and leadership in schools at the moment, simply because it is the driving force. And so, therefore, at some point, you need to address the issue of your understanding of what it means in terms of this gap. It's sometimes it's referred to as the long tail of underachievement, isn't it? And what does it look like in your context? So nationally, we have a problem where more young people fail to reach a published, uh, an agreed standard in this um, system than in most other European systems. Some schools have no gap in this country. Others have a very long tail indeed. So one of the, the key components of your conceptual framework, the contextual issues, is going to be something to do with closing the gap. And uh, although I have no problems at all with totally ignoring Ofsted, it's going to be very difficult, isn't it? Because, of, for example, if you're doing work around leadership, then the Ofsted framework has totally changed our understanding of what school leadership looks like, hasn't it? If you haven't had a chance to read the framework, if you read the section on, on leadership, then basically what it's saying is the function of school leaders, whether it's uh, um, uh, senior leaders or, or middle leaders, is to improve the quality of teaching and learning. You know, that is a fundamental shift from the, the 101 things that school leaders could do. If you think about the previous Ofsted framework of 27 categories and the current Ofsted framework with four categories, then there is a real shift in terms of the conceptual framework that we're working on. In other words, the language has changed, the priorities have changed, and therefore you may need to be very much focused in on the issues around the um, prevailing orthodoxy in terms of accountability and the criteria for what constitutes good practice and so on. And that's the issue around classroom practice. And again, one has to say, if you have got a certain amount of time, a certain amount of energy available to you, what's the most significant thing to look at? It is almost certainly classroom practice, isn't it? That's the one that's going to make or break schools. That's the one that is most significant. That's the one that really, I think, is at the heart of most of what's going on. Now, there are 101 different ways of approaching that. But one of the challenges is, and this can be worked at many different levels, is simply how confident and robust is your school with regard to the quality of teaching and practice, and basically how do we understand that process in terms of how do we improve, how do we support. For example, there is a great deal of evidence and again you've got to debate it, which points out that from a number of perspectives, the single most powerful change that would improve the performance of many young people is to do with the quality of teacher feedback in the classroom. And I think that's fairly compelling. So, for example, you've got John Hattie's book, Visible Learning, which is the most definitive synthesis of research there's ever been around classroom practice. And just to give you an idea of how academics live their lives, for the past 25 years or so, Professor Hattie has looked at every single piece of research ever done on effective classroom practice. He and his team have looked at over 500,000 pieces of classroom-based research. You really think, what sort of life <laughs> is involved in that, don't you? And the book, Visible Learning, which of course every classroom in your school has a copy of, doesn't it? Really? Is the synthesis of all that research. And what it says in impeccable um, and very, very robust language is basically the feedback that teachers give students is the single most powerful vehicle for bringing about improved achievement. And you say, that's really compelling. So if we're looking at a context in which we're looking at closing the gap, the Ofsted framework's focus on teaching and learning, 
the, the centrality of classroom practice in everything that goes on in the current climate, then hey, we've got wonderful news. John Hattie says. And then we can go and look at the work of Carol Dweck. Yeah? If you haven't, if you haven't come across Carol Dweck, web, <coughs> her website is just caroldweck.org and she spells her name D-W-E-C-K. And her research points to the fact that, guess what? The single most powerful factor in improving pupil achievement, student achievement, is the quality of feedback. But Dweck says it, the sort of feedback that many teachers give, i.e., what a good piece of work you are, a good lad, is totally the wrong sort. What we should be saying, that's good, but can't you improve it? Um, do, these, do they focus more on verbal or, or written feedback? This is on the interaction in the classroom now. Right. And so that was a very useful question, but could you speak up, please? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm giving you positive affirmation, but I'm actually challenging you. And that's what Carol Drex says makes the difference. And so uh, in John Hattie's work, the, the formative assessment based on, on written work, that comes about fourth or fifth down the list, and it's important. But according to Dweck and according to Hattie, it's the way that you and I interact and the way that I'm saying basically this would be good if you were, had put in more effort, that this would be good if you thought about doing it in a different way. Um, the school on Merseyside, their mission statements, if you accept the value of such things, is be kind, work hard. Yeah, and that's interesting, isn't it? Because that's the, that's the Carol Dweck notion that actually we don't work hard enough. You know, I've done some work, here it is, you say something positive to me about it, well done John, you've tried really hard there. Now, nah. you know, w that's good John, but it could be better. So, for some colleagues that's really challenging, isn't it? So you've got Hattie, you've got Dweck, and then you've got the Sutton Trust report published by, the big one, the report by the University <coughs> of Durham, published by the Sutton Trust in May of last year, on how to spend your pupil premium. And you're all familiar with this? Great. Because what it does, of course, is to say if you really want to improve academic achievement in schools, then do not even think about reducing class size. Because, as you know, reducing class size will lead to a fall in standards, won't it? All agreed on that? Great. No argument there, then. That's good, isn't it? Because if we were to reduce, mathematicians help me here, if we were to reduce the average class size in primary schools, say, from 28 to 30 down to 20, how many more teachers would we need? Around about 150,000. Now, even with the army being closed down, we're not going to get enough, are we? <laughs> and according to some very distinguished academics, actually reducing class size from 30 down to 20 would make no difference. In fact, it would make things worse. It's only when we get down to 12 to 15 it begins to bite. And equally, the presence in your classrooms of teaching assistants has made no impact over the past 10, 12 years on, on standards, has it? Has it? No, thank you very much indeed. We now have, we're spend, we now have 270% more people in schools than we had in 1999, but they've made virtually no discernible impact upon achievement. They've made an impact in all sorts of wonderful ways, they're great people, but what they've not done is improve performance. What, according to the Sutton Trust Report, makes the difference with regard to performance in classrooms is first and foremost, guess what, feedback. Can you see where I'm taking you, colleagues? And the notion is that what you're doing is saying, in this context, what seems to be making the difference? And so you go through all of those processes and say, the evidence is overwhelming. And again, it depends how you regard evidence, that this is what we should be doing. But then we have the, the problem of identifying what it look, actually looks like, and that's available. But then we move on to the final component, which is that if, I am, if we're really going to secure sustained achievement across the school, then it might just be that some of our colleagues have got to engage in personal change. 
And that's where a topic like this gets interesting. And there's the challenge, isn't it? Because this is, I mean, the, hopefully you've seen there's a fairly neat logic in going from closing the gap, the Ofsted framework, classroom practice, focusing on feedback, but then we come up to the big challenge, don't we? If we're really going to make a difference, you've got to take somebody like Mr. West Burnham, who's been in teaching for 42 years and basically prefers to work in his own rather idiosyncratic way. And John Hattie's got a wonderful phrase, most teachers do little harm. Isn't that great? <laughs> and unfortunately, this teacher does. But I've decided to stay on for a few years to help you out. I will work in my usual idiosyncratic way where I work according to my term, on, on my terms, according to my way of comfort in the classroom. Come on, make me change. Yeah? Any volunteers to make me change, please? <laughs> Because that's when you move into the leadership issues, that's when you move into the pedagogic issues, isn't it? That's when suddenly this project, which was going so well, moves into a totally different category. Because in the final analysis, what you cannot do is say, hello, John, I've come to research how you change your practice in the classroom. Because I will say there are certain key misapprehensions, firstly, that you're coming to my classroom, and secondly, that I'm going to change. And there's the challenge, isn't it? That's why the notion that I'm going to research the issues around changing practice in classrooms in school may be slightly naive. Does, does that all make sense, colleagues? Mm -hmm. Yep. So you, you go down from the big picture to the school picture, but when you come down to my practice in my classroom, no thank you, the, the door shut. And that is one of the great challenges. We're doing research which by most criteria is pivotally important, but which takes us into very, very sensitive areas. And I'm sure you could all think, and in fact, you know, play with it now, please. The notion is that your research is based upon goodwill, isn't it? You know, your research is based upon volunteers. And therefore, your topic has to have the, the capacity to a actually allow people to engage with it. So, um, I've just talked you through one model of a, p a potential process until we come to the real sticking point. So it may be that what you can't do is research how people actually change their practice. You may have to research people's perceptions about changing their practice. That's valid. You may have to talk to colleagues who are middle leaders and say, how do you perceive your role in changing practice? Because it's that sort of issue which is the really challenging one. So, let's look at the nice, neat logic that it's all available. And, I mean, the issue, of, the topic of feedback has got some fabulous research associated with it. Incredibly robust. But it comes to the point eventually where it is simply too difficult to make it work in practice. And maybe outside the scope of your research. So if you would please, just for five minutes or so, and those of you who are, are still <coughs> beginning to come around, there's more cake, there's more tea, help yourselves. But basically, what are the boundaries of your research, please? Okay? Any issues? Any thoughts? Any, well, uh, several of you just raised them personally, but did that make sense, yes. that process? Yes. Good. So, therefore, let's be pragmatic, let's be realistic, let's be very clear that there are boundaries which are, we are, are going to have to work within if we're going to deliver a coherent and useful piece of research. Yep. And sometimes it's not so much how, do we, how are we going to change classroom practice, it's rather what are people's attitudes towards changing classroom practice. That in itself is valuable, isn't it? So don't expect that the world will change because you're doing a piece of, of, of small-scale research. But at the same time, don't lose ambition, don't lose aspiration in terms of the potential. It's where you feel your research is going to make a difference. That's the important thing. John, can I ask you a question? Because some of the language you're using, I think it's perhaps got nuanced meaning. Yeah. Meaning. And you've spoken about Hattie's work and Dweck's work as being based upon robust data, and you've just yeah. spoken about clear and coherent research inquiry 
could you define and differentiate, or perhaps as we go through the course of this evening, to make clear what you understand as a robust yep. research inquiry? Th thank you for that. Think of your, um, think of virtually any um, television program or, or, or film drama based around a court case. And if it's based in this country, then it's all about barristers, isn't it? And it's all about barristers putting forward evidence. Now, very crudely, as you are aware, there's a continuum of evidence, which in American movies is basically over here with DNA, which is usually available within half an hour of the murder taking place. <laughs> yep. And DNA, as far as we know, although there's some question marks over it now, but as far as we know, DNA is basically absolute certainty. So DNA, hard scientific-based evidence, is virtually, if you like, 100% reliable. It's not, but that's, you know, it's as close as. At the other end of the spectrum is basically circumstantial evidence. And the laws of evidence in British courts are very clear as to where juries should place their greatest trust. So the issue I would put to you, ladies and gentlemen, is basically what sources of evidence do you trust? Yep, and that's very personal because the anecdotal evidence sometimes is immensely powerful. And never forget your own experience. As you, I was just saying, I introduced the Hattie work on, on TAs to a group of primary deputies and said basically your TAs are a waste of money, you'd be far better off getting rid of them and employing two, three, four um, full-time qualified teachers <coughs> instead. And one of them said, that's rubbish because my TA is magical. And my response was, your TA may be magical, but the evidence is that she is part of a group who have not made a contribution towards raising achievement. And there's the tension. What I know in my experience, which is robust to me, but may not be, and here's the key word, generalizable. <coughs> in other words, can we make this a universal proposition? Is it true in all cases? And I think that is where the big debate comes in. Hattie has spent most of his adult life scouring different sources of research evidence, which in themselves are, here come the, the, the key words, valid and reliable in order to synthesize and make a, 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 a macro study is how he describes it which is based upon components which are highly reliable of themselves and the argument there is that because this is made up of reliable studies in turn the macro study becomes totally reliable and robust and trustworthy and therefore you can use it the Sutton Trust Report, and they are very clear <coughs> about just how, how cautious they are about certain aspects, because their evidence base is not as strong as Hattie's. But they're still very clear that they are confident in their outcomes. And then the Carol Dweck work is based upon years and years of, of research based in cognitive psychology. So again, you see, that's where we can be robust. This is not somebody saying, here's a good idea. But this takes us into the problem we were just discussing, that education policy at national level and at school level may not take evidence into account. Yep. And one of the great challenges, and um, there are, there's a huge amount of work based on this area, is the extent to which leadership and practice in schools in this country is evidence-based. Because if it was, then we would be... If you take the Sutton Trust Report, their top three areas in terms of impact on achievement and cost-effectiveness are firstly <coughs> feedback, secondly cognitive development, i.e. philosophy for children, as an example, and thirdly peer support. And they're saying those three have the greatest impact and therefore are most worthy of your attention. I haven't come across many schools where those three have been put into place in the past 12 months since that report was published. Why? Because A, local practice, B, uncertainty, ambiguity about you know, can we trust this research? And remember that in this country the word academic in the education profession is a term of abuse. We can't do that, it's far too academic. <coughs> 
Is that true? So we have a different culture at work. But what I would suggest to you is that sometimes it's entirely right and proper to be over here on the circumstantial side. Sometimes you have to be over here on the forensic side. For example, if you are exploring teachers' emotional response to change in their classroom practice, and see how I put in a caveat word immediately, their emotional response to change, then I think it's entirely proper to collect anecdotal evidence. Because it's not anecdotal evidence, it's personal life stories, isn't it? And there's a very, very strong and very powerful methodological argument in favour of using that kind of data. But then you have to be very careful about how much credence you place on your conclusions because what you are dealing with is evidence based upon people's emotional responses which are not subject to any kind of formal cross-referencing. And therefore you're talking about people's emotional outbursts, essentially. But the notion of narrative, of biography, I think is hugely powerful. But we have to remember not to base policy on it in the first instance, but corroborate and extend. Does that go some way? So see yourselves essentially as researchers in the position of barristers. And in your job, in your dissertation, is to amass evidence, partly through your literature review, that says here's the corroborative evidence, and then through your own investigation, which says here's the specific evidence. And then you have increased confidence, and therefore I can trust you, what you say. Is that right? And I think that, you know, I'm always anxious at master's level about going for you know, massive amounts of st uh, statistical work. But basically, you need to have the same disciplines with regard to your evidence as the statistician does with regard to the data that they generate. It's got to be valid. It's got to be reliable. All account validity and reliability. Have you spent some time on that? You're comfortable? Yeah. Right, fine. We'll move on then. So, Sorry. Um, no, no, never apologise. <coughs> We're glad you're here. <laughs> uh, I'm just thinking about like uh, triangulation of, of, of my data because uh, I'm looking, I guess, at, at parental responses to a particular yeah. scenario. Is it all right to triangulate within the same paradigm? Oh, yes. So that I'm not using specific data, but I'm using maybe interviews from parents, students, and teachers. Absolutely right. And then, did you hear that wonderful phrase then, ladies and gentlemen? Triangulation within the same paradigm. This is a man who's going places, right? <laughs> the language is there. So that's exactly right, because you have created a paradigm which is the contextual issue for your research. And then within that paradigm, you are making sure there is consistency in the relationships, sorry, the relationships between the different elements. And that's great, because the more you triangulate, the more you find internal consistency within your paradigm, the higher is the trustworthiness of your research. Thank you for that. I'm a scientist, yep. um, which I think is a bit of a hindrance. Um, no one commented when you said about valid and reliable. Yep. Um, if I'm alone, I'll speak to you at another point. <laughs> um, could you just briefly say something about validity and reliability? Yeah, sure. Um, let me try and express it this way. I'm, I'm not, if I get this wrong, then shout me down. Um, some people, apparently, are concerned about their health and well-being, and their major measure of, of, of checking this is by weighing themselves, checking on their weight. And so they go to the bathroom once a week, and they weigh themselves, and let's say, on week one, they're 75 kilos, week two, they're 76 kilos, week three, they're 80 kilos, that was a good party, and, and so on. And that what you're finding is that if you actually um, record the scores, and you know this scientifically, and you find there's a pattern emerging where they're clustering, then you've got reliability because basically there aren't extremes. Yep. Now then, that's reliability. Then the, you can basically say that each time you test the machine, it comes up with broadly consistent results. However, 
When you go to another machine, you find that in fact you weigh 60 kilos. So although your machine is reliable, it's not actually valid. And many of you may have come across the experience that you know how much you weigh until you go to the clinic. <laughs> when the medical scales give you a totally false reading, <laughs> several kilos ahead of your own. And does that make sense, that example? Yeah, that's and so, basically, I am going to investigate pupil perceptions of, and so I need to make sure that it's reliable in the sense that the questionnaire I'm using produces the same results. Yep. But then it's also got to be valid in the sense that it's actually describing what I want it to describe. That, and that means, for example, the ambiguity that you find with some questions in questionnaires. And therefore, if you, that's, why you must, that's why you must trial a questionnaire, especially if you're going to have a quantitative element within it, in order to make sure that it is reliable, i.e. you get a broadly consistent feedback, but also it's valid because it's actually telling you what you need to know. Very yeah, yeah. Um, can it still be valid and reliable if I'm using anecdotal and group interviews and observations, or does that problematize my results? When we move from the, the allegedly objective into the subjective, then I have no problem with that at all as long as you are very precise in saying this is the status of this data. Yeah? And we'll come on to this in, in more detail in just a moment. But basically, I think the crucial thing is that virtually any form of evidence is acceptable as long as you acknowledge the fact there are different types of evidence and you say, and my evidence is this type of evidence and it's trustworthy because I have triangulated it within the paradigm to use a well-known phrasal saying that's been invented this evening. <laughs> yeah? And that process of triangulation... So. Um, there's a, a, a big row at the moment. Well, not so much at the moment. I think it's blown over now. Uh, with regard to um, field studies in anthropology, ethnography. And this was prompted by an Australian anthropologist who basically challenged Margaret Mead's work growing up in Samoa. And you know, growing up in Samoa was one of the pivotal pieces of anthropological study and it gave a real insight into um, a society which was totally outside most Western people's understanding. And what does uh, uh, an Australian anthropologist went to Samoa and said to the old ladies, does anybody here remembering talking to an American lady about 60 years ago? And several of them were still alive. And so this guy had conversations with them about their conversations with Margaret Mead. And they said, well, she, she was a lovely girl, and um, she was very interested in our sex lives, and we, we told her some stories to keep her happy. And the issue is that, according to this Australian anthropologist, Mead was simply beguiled by the exotic and didn't test, didn't corroborate. And therefore, she wrote a book about a, a society which was based upon fiction. But she... Because it was so powerful at the time, everybody accepted it. But now, even within a study of uh, simple societies, you've got to triangulate, you've got to test, you've got to say, is this really the case? Or is this, this just people being nice to the visitor? And that, as you know, is often referred to in another context as the Hawthorne effect. You know, whereby the very act of talking to somebody changes their perception and their engagement. And if you haven't heard about the Hawthorne effect, it was studies done in the 1930s. And it was, I think it was an e electrical components factory. And th they had some sociologists in to say, what makes people work harder? And they looked at the, f the figures in terms of productivity and so on. And they discovered that the most important factor in productivity increasing were visits by the sociologists. Yeah? In other words... It's being part of a process which made people behave in a, certain, in a different way. So you need to be very, very punctilious. For example, if you are researching with children, and the, the ethical issues on that are fundamental, 
you know, informed consent is absolutely vital, <coughs> then one of the challenges is how can you be sure that the pupils that you are questioning are replying to you as researcher or you as their favourite teacher? Yeah? That they want to please you and therefore they give you the answers that you think. And that's one of the challenges. And that's why some form of triangulation is absolutely essential. And so, for example, you use different techniques. So it may be that the most powerful source of ideas, and I did some work a few years ago on, on children's spirituality, and the, the stuff they spoke through uh, about was just wonderful. But we had to be very careful in terms of saying this is spirituality, because what we were doing, I think, was actually imposing our values in a way that might not have been appropriate. Yeah? So it's really important point in, uh, that you've raised. The notion is, how can I increase confidence? In other words, do I convict or acquit on the basis of the evidence that I presented? John, can I say at this point that I think it's also really important that when you're doing the trial of your research tool, that you take that you just test the extent to which you're asking leading questions as well. Because for all you might account the Hawthorne effect, if you ask a leading question, you'll get the answer that you want. So I think you also need to be very careful that you're not asking tag time questions. Yeah. And so that triangulation through different techniques, can you give me an example of that? So is that just like using a survey so that that's not advised? Yeah, there? absolutely. So you might, um, for example, uh, the departments just issued guidelines on teacher appraisal. Now, they are guidelines, they're not mandatory, but they have they put forward their preferred model of teacher appraisal in schools. So, you, you're working in a school of 100 um, teaching staff. Your research is to look at teacher attitudes towards the, the appraisal process. Now, you can't interview 100 teachers. That would be, you know, the amount of, of data would simply be unmanageable. That's another issue, by the way. Make sure you can manage your data. But basically what you might decide to do is firstly to survey in a fairly simple way all the staff to get a broad quantifiable um, response in terms of a range of particular areas which you've identified as being significant. On the basis of that you could then go and say I'm going to interview and here comes the next big challenge what sort of sample are you going to look at? And so, in a, uh, with 100 staff, you might say, I'm going to have a small sample of, say, 10, 12, and they're going to be a vertical cross-section of the school in terms of, of hierarchy, management structure, and so on. So I can differentiate between different attitudes. So then you've got more specific data, and then thirdly, what you may do is simply go back to another sample and say, here's what this sample have said, how, do you, how, how does that come coincide with what you say. Does that work? Yes. yes. Yeah? And so you, or each time you take the same basic data and, and investigate it in a different way, you are building confidence, I would argue. Yep. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. I'm going to do it for time. Heavens above. It flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? Are you all comfortable? Are we all right? So, uh, where are we? We're only on four, I'm afraid, so it may be midnight, but meals and, and blankets will be brought in. Now then, I think that one of the, one of the causes of most anxiety over doing research projects, and one of the areas where people do get into difficulty, is because they don't do what a, co a former colleague of mine said was the best and simple most important rule in terms of um, successful research which is a three-part rule. Part number one, focus. Part number two, focus. Part number three, focus. Focus, focus, focus. And so, for example, we're looking at the issue of moving practice across the school into certain areas which we know are more successful than others. And therefore, it may be that the focus of your research is, as it says in question uh, in point four, teacher attitudes to ensuring consistent practice in classrooms. Yeah? So that one of the arguments is that the way that you get rid of this tale of underachievement, the way that you increase confidence, the way that you get outstanding from Ofsted,
is by high levels of consistency. So you are not going to investigate how to make teaching in your school more consistent that's because that's beyond your remit. But what it would be interesting, and again it's laying foundations for future activities, to say let's look at people's attitudes to the notion that, if you like, there are certain non-negotiables in terms of classroom practice. In this school, we are going to say that there are things that we expect everybody to do. And so your focus is how do teachers respond to the notion that irrespective of Ofsted or the Secretary of State or whatever, that we are expecting you to adopt certain strategies irrespective of your personal preferences. That's interesting, isn't it? Because in some schools, the culture is essentially laissez-faire. Is that a fair comment? When it comes to teaching and learning. In other schools, things are far more directed. But if we are really going to close the gap, and here comes a, a real leadership challenge, then we need to be confident that more teachers are using effective strategies for most of the time. And uh, in some aspects of our educational system, that is a very, very different way of approaching things. Now, the, you're not going to research how it works in practice, but what you can do with appropriate support from senior colleagues is to simply say, let's test out the waters. How do people feel about this? How do you feel, for example, that um, you should begin to I I use a different range of strategies according to, for example, in the Ofsted framework, it's very clear, I haven't got the words exactly right, but that every student, including vulnerable students, makes progress every lesson. Now, that strikes me as a basic human right. Yep. So, what do we have to do in order to achieve that? Well, the answer is we have to have certain strategies in place which are non-negotiable and absolutely built into requirements. The role of middle leaders is to secure that so, for example, you might have a project which is saying to middle leader colleagues, how do you feel about having to, and the word here is probably wrong, not enforce, but secure consistent practice in certain aspects of people's classroom work? That would be quite an interesting topic, wouldn't it? Because in some contexts, we are not used to that at all. But the issue is, if this is robust, high confidence evidence, then shouldn't everybody be using it, irrespective of their personal beliefs or, or comfort zones or whatever. I mean, one of the interesting things about medical research is that if they find, for example, that they're researching into a particular cancer drug, and there's a case about this quite recently, wasn't there? If they find it actually works, then the trial is stopped immediately and it becomes available. You know, that's one of the really interesting things about, um, for example, surgical practice, is that if somebody finds a better way of dealing with a particular issue, then that goes onto the internet almost immediately. You know, um, the medical profession are very, very good at sharing the best practice. And there are certain things, as you know, if you've been anywhere near hospitals, is that there are certain non-negotiables in terms of good practice, aren't there? You, know, you do not do these things. Um, I had a, a, a brief medical experience recently, and it was very interesting because none of the male staff wore ties or jackets. It was all open neck shirts and short sleeve shirts because that's one of the best ways. Ties apparently are really disgusting in the hospital environment because they pick up everything. So don't wear ties. Now, how do you know who the consultants are? Because they used to wear bow ties, didn't they? That was better. But the notion is that it's based on good hygiene practice, but it actually requires a cultural shift to say, you don't go to work if you're a senior doctor wearing a jacket and a tie. You go to work wearing a short sleeve shirt and an open neck shirt. That's totally different in terms of perception, in terms of behaviours and so on. That's difficult in human beings, isn't it? Yeah. Anything else on this one? So... Get the focus right. Now, point number five, and I'm sure most of you have already done work on this, and this again is personal. I'm not saying there's one right answer, 
my own view is that you need to think of your research as essentially a problem solving activity and the best way to set that up is to have a research question which probably comes at the end of your first <coughs> chapter, the context chapter if you like, if that's the way you decide to do it, and saying on the basis of the issues that I'm exploring, I'm going to come down to one research key research issue which is my big research question and again this is purely my own personal way of working so don't take it too seriously but I think that eventually that research question becomes your um, title yeah because then you've got the focus clear focus 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 all the way through and that there may be subordinate research <coughs> questions so there may be I'm going to research teacher perceptions of consistency so one a subordinate question will be what does the literature tell me about effective practice another research question will be what are the methodological approaches that are most appropriate for finding this kind of evidence out and so on and so on and so on and again and I, if this it may be too um, uh, too oversimplified but basically your research questions help you su um, structure your final thesis they give you the key themes it's a bit like in a piece of music. You know, there are three, four, five main themes and they come in sequence and then at the end you know exactly where you are because the, all the, the various different themes have been played. But does that make any sense? Just nod or smile. Um, so, th 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 there's an issue around literature and one of the, the key things, and again, it's, this is personal anecdotal, therefore it with caution, but sometimes you read dissertations, and I think the structure of the approach here is very different, but you, you almost read th four or five different chapters in the sense of, here's my introduction, here's the literature, here's the methodology, here's the results, here's the conclusions. And that, what I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, is that you need to have some kind of continual thread running through, and that's your conceptual framework. So, for example, given the context of my school, given the issues that we face in terms of our intake, given our culture, given our history, then I think that the most appropriate way of conceptualizing improving teaching and learning is, and you take the evidence and you synthesize it, and that gives you the foundations for your questionnaires, etc., etc. For example, the issue which is, is, is going to be very challenging in some secondary schools, that everybody teaches literacy first. You know, that your role as a subject teacher is subordinate to your role as a facilitator of literacy. Now then, what does that mean in practice? Well, we need a conceptual map of the role of the teacher with regard to engaging with literacy and using history, geography, maths, science, as a vehicle for securing literacy because it's the literacy that really makes the difference, isn't it? If you ain't got the literacy, you're going nowhere. But you need to explain exactly what you mean by literacy. Yes? Because it is a contested topic, isn't it? And therefore, you need to be aware of the, the pressure that uh, the department will be putting on primary schools in terms of all the things that Mr. Gove was talking about, um, well, no, he's, not, he's talking about them on Thursday, but they were leaked on, um, on Sunday. But basically, learn a poem by the age of five, etc., etc. Now, then, I think the Iliad may be too much for certain infants. <laughs> but I think, I think in reception, they could do with Wordsworth, couldn't they? You know, I mean, they'd handle that. But the notion is that you need to say, in the context of this assignment, I am taking literacy to mean that. And I'm aware that there are alternative perceptions. Um, John, can I ask yeah, please. About, about literature? You know, if you're researching into something, and there might be very much British literature on the topic, mm -hmm. so it might be North American, yep. and it might be 1980s, 1990s. Um, you know, we're talking about sort of validity and yep. authenticity. You have to do a literature review. So, through no part of your own, you know, there might be very much British research within the last decade. Mm. No, um, so, 
What I'm really asking is how much emphasis do you give to say Australian and North American research, which might be 20 or 30 yeah. years old? Oh, uh, I mean, I mean if, 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 if it's that old, it's probably past its sell-by date because it's the context has changed. Even in the 1980s, I would worry because, I mean, there's so much now. You know, I mean, and that's, thank you for raising the point because it does move us on nicely and I'll, I'll build on it now if I may. But basically, um, my view is that you take whatever evidence you can find in terms of literature and therefore you, you do the searching and that... Depending upon your focus, you begin to track down appropriate sources, and you've got the library here as a resource, and you do it in two ways. One is that you look for the big names, and then the other is you go into the journals. Now then, there's no rule of thumb on this, because you're quite right. Some topics will have very, very limited amounts written about them. So, for example, if you decide to look at teams in schools, it's overwhelming, it's a massive amount of stuff. But if you look at um, middle leaders as performance managers, virtually nothing. And so therefore, this again is part of the pragmatic approach saying, has my topic got legs? Well, the answer is, have I got access to appropriate research? One of the best ways of starting your research in terms of mapping out what's available is to go onto the National College website. Because that is the best free resource in the history of the world ever. And you are all signed up members of the National College, aren't you? Good. I'm not going to ask for a hands up on this one, but can I just say to you that it's already lost its autonomy. It's now a department of the department. And it's very fragile at the moment. And if you don't belong to it, then it will, the government will eventually say, well, nobody's using it. The more use you make of it, and it's the most fabulous free resource, it's, it's the envy of just about every other system in the world. And if you use their search procedures, you will find an amazing amount of resource on most topics that are likely to crop up in terms of your dissertations. Would you say if something's very rich in research, is that slightly off because so many people don't research yeah. that much? On? No, it means that you're dealing with something that's very important. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. But we still haven't cracked it, have we? It's still a problem. But there's a huge amount of uh, yeah. But there again, you see, no piece of research can ever be truly original. That's impossible in this day and age. But doing the research in your context and making it real within your situation—that's the great thing. That's the thing that makes the difference. Yeah. New knowledge of your school. It's, it's new knowledge of your school. That's perfect. Thank you. And therefore, if your school is having an issue and struggling with the, the notion of, particularly, for example, boys' literacy, then if there hasn't been a systematic study of what re research might be helpful to our school, then you are doing something very powerful and valuable. So you need to have this conceptual framework. And I'll come back to that in a second. You need to be very clear about your methodology and you need to be clear about your methods. More on that in just a second. The key conceptual frames are things like, for example, the notion of arguing that the reason why we should close the gap, the reason why we should get rid of this tale of underachievement, is to do with equity in education. And you know, there's a moral imperative that how can you be a an educator if you are not personally morally committed to the notion that every child is entitled to exactly the same educational opportunities. But it's quite an important frame, isn't it? Because if you believe in equity, then you have to say, how does that um, figure with our work with children with special needs, for example? Are we really making sure that we are guaranteeing their entitlement to the curriculum? Because that's a challenging one. Um, I, I may have used this example on a previous occasion, but um, a year and a half ago, the parents of Down syndrome children, their association, um, looked at schools that said on their website, we are inclusive. And they took along their Down syndrome teenage children and said, you say you're an inclusive school, here's our child, and we would love her to be educated at your school. And in 90% of the cases, the school said, ah, we're not quite that inclusive. 
And that's scandalous, isn't it? They should actually not be allowed to say we're an inclusive school. They'll say we are an inclusive school up to the point where it becomes inconvenient, inconvenient for us to accommodate your child. Something like that. We're an inclusive school apart from children with the following behavioural problems. Because that's the reality, isn't it? But if you believe that equity is the basis of justice in a society, if you believe that your role as a leader is to secure the entitlement of every child to effective learning, then shouldn't that be underpinning your research in a fairly fundamental way? You know, how do we secure effective learning for every child? I will put my hand up now and say when I was timetabling a secondary school of 105 staff, not all of those staff were equally effective. And I engaged in a strategy known as defensive timetabling, which fortunately doesn't happen anymore, I believe. Is that true? Whereby teachers are placed with classes with whom they will do the least damage. Yeah, you may have heard about this. You may have heard of situations, for example, the shocking thing that happened years ago, when by the most effective teachers went with the most able children. Fortunately, that doesn't happen anymore either, does it? No, of course not. Good, 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 good. Sorry to waste your time on those issues. There's an issue around what you believe to be the moral basis of what you do. There's an issue around what you understand by effective pedagogy. There's an issue around how change occurs in schools. There's no right answers on any of those. But in your um, presentation, in your dissertation, you need to be fairly robustly confident that you have thought through your, your take on that. And then we move on to the methodological issues. In other words, I've identified what I want to find out. Now the big question is, how am I going to find it out? And that takes us back to the barrister. That takes us back to the law courts. And I suppose the first issue I would raise with you on this is the notion of be very circumspect in interviews, questionnaires, and so on. The, the amount of data that can be... I can't remember the exact num amount, but basically a human being talking at the rate I'm talking at the moment, I'm probably talking at the rate of two to three words a second. And if you were to take me for half an hour, yeah, the most enormous amount of stuff. And how are you going to manage that? Life is too short to sit and listening to me for half an hour. Yeah, you can't transcribe it either, can you? You haven't got time or skill to do that. You haven't got the resource to do that. And therefore, you have to be very, very clear and say, I'm going to use semi-structured interviews, which are going to be very short, very focused, and blah, blah, blah. John, sorry to interrupt you, but just the weekend I was looking at this, uh, how to do some transcription myself, and a very, very helpful employee of Apple um, directed me towards an app called Dragon Diction. Yeah. Really great. So voice record your interviews and it will transcribe it for you. So it's Dragon Diction. It's free as an app. So. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I mean, uh, and... That's great, but again, you can have an overwhelming amount of data. That's my anxiety. So be modest in how big your questionnaires are. Be cautious in how many people you interview. Make it appropriate to you managing it within a limited time frame with limited resources. But the crucial thing is, what sort of methodological approach are you going to adopt? In other words, and I suppose the key phrase here is form follows function. If you are investigating teacher attitudes, then you may want to get their own personal language in place. And therefore, your methodology will move towards the qualitative. If you're doing a survey of a different type of issue, then it may be that you move more into the quantitative. But you need to be very clear that going into the qualitative and in, alternatively into the quantitative has implications in terms of the way in which you present the knowledge you're creating. And you need to talk about that. And that, that's the sort of issue on page two, which I'm not going to go into detail now. But basically, on those various continuum, you need to say, am I going to be positivistic? In other words, work on a scientific frame, 
or am I going to be f- working on a f- phenomenological model whereby it's essentially s- you know, the difference between objective and subjective? And that sort of debate will determine the validity, the reliability, and the trustworthiness. You need to tell us what sort of strategy you're using in order to justify the approach. And you know, very crudely at the bottom there, on the, the extreme left, you have you know, science at its very best, which is based on experimentation, which is you know, double-blind and, uh, and so on, and absolutely rigorous and systematic. And then you go through the social sciences, which aspires to be objective, but there's a big debate about that. Then you're into the politics, and then you're into personal narratives, and then you're into personal beliefs. And you need to know where you are situating your research on that continuum, because that's going to make all the difference to the credibility. Acknowledging the fact that sometimes your evidence may be challenged, may be questioned. And then having identified what's the most appropriate methodological approach, you then need to say what methods are most appropriate. And I suppose that of all the thousands of master's dissertations in education that are done over the years, everybody comes down to the, the questionnaire with a few interviews. Yeah, and again, be open. For example, one of the, um, the areas that I find uh, fascinating is the way that people engage with personal change in a very demanding and challenging environment. And therefore, um, I've done some work in the past around the use of diaries. You know, just keeping a very simple log of how do I feel about the work today? And when you, people do that over time, you build up an incredibly powerful resource. But it's way out on the qualitative side of things, isn't it? But actually, it's an authentic voice. And there's a, a wonderful amount of work done in terms of um, research within a feminist context of recognizing the authenticity of people's voices and some very interesting work around student voice as well. And so don't just write it off because it's um, subjective, because it may be it gives you the authentic engagement with what people are really feeling. It, but that depends upon what it is you're trying to find out, doesn't it? Fitness for purpose. What do I want to find out? What's the best way of finding out? I will get you away on time, I promise. Very briefly, the, the ethical issues Essentially, it's all to do with your, um, your sample, isn't it? And again, as we mentioned earlier, it's the informed consent. People know that you're researching them. And I think it's, you know, it's, um, it, it's very, very unprofessional. And it has happened whereby people send out surveys, and they say it's a school survey, and in fact it's their personal research. That's not acceptable, is it? And that's the sort of issue that we need to be very careful about. <coughs> On the issue of the ethical form that needs to be filled in, one university I worked in, the first question on the form was, does this research involve experimentation on animals? And one of my students wrote, no, it's OK, it's year nine students. <laughs> you need to be very punctilious indeed in terms of making sure that you meet the criteria because the current thinking around um, research, your practitioner-led research based in the workplace is that you've got to be absolutely crystal clear in terms of the clarity. Number 10, I think we've mentioned. Number 11 is interesting, isn't it? Because you've really got to say, who's my audience? What's this for? How does it look? And if I may say so, with a degree of um, pain from a, from over the years, is it readable? You know, and is it structured? Is it logical? Crucially, is it consistently presented? And then, finally, and again, I don't know what your, how this works here, but I would expect in any piece of research, in the conclusion, you to say, I have changed, I have learnt, I have grown, I have made a difference because of this research. And you need to move into some kind of meta-reflection on the process of being a researcher and how it's informed your own professional practice. <laughs>
Yeah. Let's just take a pause there because I've, I, 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 I've scrambled through that. We've got about um, just over five minutes left. Just to, very quickly, please, with your neighbour, things which are positive, things which are challenging, things which are worrying you still, and then we'll have five minutes quick buzz on issues that are emerging, and then we'll call it a day. Yeah. So thank you very much for your stamina. Um, hopefully that's given you some framework. And, uh, and, and, if, and if so, I'm, I'm pleased. Are the, the, the gaps, are the things which are not... I mean, that was a very fast overview, I appreciate, but is there anything that really is bugging you? That you came here this evening to have sorted out and it's not been sorted out? It's not a sort of burning issue, mate. It's something that um, I've been thinking about. It's um, bias in qualitative research, how addressing that, because obviously we're all from our own point of views. Yes. And yep. our own hermeneutics, et cetera. So it, it, would you be able to... I think that goes back to paradigms and triangulation, basically. You know, and that's the theme of the evening. And you, I want you all to sing that as you go out. But, but, it, but I was going to say, because we're only trialling a tool, it's one tool, so <coughs> at this stage we're not really... Absolutely, and therefore you put on very, very careful and very precise caveats. Okay. Yeah, and I think that I think that the mistake that people make is not to say, this is very early stuff. You know, that we are really cautious about this data and we are anxious about its, its, its transferability, its applicability and so on. And as long as you are very robust in saying we have got to put very clear boundaries on this, this works in this context, but it works because of these variables. And one of the best ways of handling a lot of these issues is to say, let's identify the variables that are functioning here and say, it's working because of this particular constellation of variables, but if you take one out, then it might well be compromised, and then you begin to uh, you begin to analyse and explain rather than simply describe. And that's one that's good research. That's really good writing. Thank you. A general looking around the room saying, who's going to dare to speak at this point of the evening? <laughs> okay. All done?